Our Torah parsha today is called Bo, in Hebrew, meaning come. And it's the first significant word in our parasha. And today we're studying the 15th weekly parasha from Genesis 1 in our annual cycle of Torah readings. And this is the third parasha in the book of Shemot, which we call Exodus in English because of the focus on the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. And this morning's parasha is going to cover Exodus 10, 11, 12, and 16 verses of chapter 13. And this parasha contains nine positive mitzvot and 11 prohibitions for a total of 20 new mitzvot commandments introduced in this parasha, which we will see when we get to chapters 12 and 13. <clears throat> Our parasha begins in chapter 10 with the words, Vayomer Adonai el Moshe, and spoke Hashem to Moshe, Bo el Paro, come to Pharaoh. Ki ani hikbati et libo, that I lay heavily upon his heart. Vet lev avat dav le ma'an, shiti o tate ale birkabo, and that I might show these my signs in the midst of them. And so our Parsha name refers to Moshe being called to come to Pharaoh to deliver a message from God that his people are to come out of Egypt, which symbolically represents the world today and its ways leading us into slavery to the false system of confusion, which prophetically Babel. And so this is why God in Revelation 18 calls us out of the world's false system, symbolically saying, come out of her, my people, that you participate not in her sins and you receive not of her plagues. But the fact that Moses was called to come and face the world leader of that day before facilitating God's people in coming out of its false system represents the spirit of Elijah, which is said to precede Messiah in calling out the leaders of the nations to repentance who are having a wrong relationship with pagan false religious systems as Pincus, did in calling Ahab and Yochan cousin did with Herod and Herodotus. And each of these were said to have the spirit of Eliyahu. And it's said that the spirit of Elijah will fall upon God's people again in these last days. And our message of repentance to God's people will be the same while calling out the leaders of the world for their false, false gods and false religions. We're seeing this beginning to happen in our day, preceding the final plagues and the greater exodus of Israel through Mashiach. And this teaches us a lesson that not only are we to avoid the evil of the world <clears throat> and be separate from its false system, but also we have a responsibility to call the nations to repentance and to come to face the leaders of these various nations, just as Moses was told to seek out the evil of Egypt at its root and then to crush it, and only then would the exodus occur. So too must we, in the macrocosm of the evils of the world's powers and the false system of today, as well as in the microcosm of our daily personal lives, which means that each person should also try to identify with the primary root of his or her personal evil and launch an attack on that with full force. And when we succeed in this mission, we will then find that God will truly assist us in our personal as well as our corporate deliverance from our slavery to sin. Pharaoh, we are told, changed his mind seven times. And that's like those that vacillate. They begin to feel a little heart of repentance, and then they harden their hearts. And ultimately, he refused time and time again to let God's people go. The Mishnah states, if a person says, I will sin, and then I'll do teshuva repentance, then he is not granted the opportunity to premeditated sin. This appears at first glance to suggest that the denied the free choice of a later teshuva. 
However, the Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya that it is still possible for any, if he will push himself hard and overcome his evil inclination, then his teshuva is accepted. And this explains why the Mishnah uses the expression that one is not granted the opportunity, in other words, that they could actually do teshuva through extreme personal exertion. So we're drawing this analogy with Pharaoh hardening his heart. And we know that God did not take away his free choice, but rather through the evil acts of his false worship and the persecution of B'nai Yisrael, he numbed his soul and sensitivity to the Ruach's conviction of sin, making it more difficult for him to do teshuva. And this teaches us a powerful lesson as well. Not only do we need to be so careful not to engage in wrong thinking and indulgence to sin as it numbs our spiritual will to be overcomers, but also we learned that if Pharaoh, whose spiritual power was from the forces of evil, was still able to do teshuva repentance, then all the more so a descendant of Israel, whose spiritual energy is derived from the Ruach's call to holiness, we are never beyond the scope of teshuva repentance and return to Torah. The remaining plagues in chapters 10 and 11, as we covered seven last week, are the final three of locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. Moshe goes into Pharaoh and he requests once more that the people be able to leave. When they answer his question as to who is to go, he refuses again on learning that it will be the whole nation together with all their flocks and their cattle. He's only willing for the men to go, even though his servants plead with him to let them go. Because it was customary in the ancient Near East for men to worship, this seemed an unreasonable request that all the families and livestock should go. He could also regard keeping the rest of the people as security for the return of the working men. And so the prophesied plague of locusts comes upon the land. Now, locusts were common in Egypt at different times and seasons. They often flew in from the east, from Arabia, driven by an east wind, and devastated the land and crops. But this plague was much worse. And they recognized Hashem's hand of judgment here. Locusts are the emblems of some of the last judgments coming upon the earth in our day, in Revelation 9, verses 3 through 10 as well. But Yah promises his people through the prophet Joel, I will restore to you the years the locust has eaten. The next plague was darkness, and darkness represents the blindness of those who are following the false system with its false religious practices, while the eyes of the righteous are spiritually open. And it is said in Mishnah Rabbah that the people of Israel enjoyed illumination, which enabled them to see even buried treasure, while the rest of the people remained in darkness. This can only be possible through a supernatural light and illumination which we are also seeing in the great awakening of the children of Israel even today amidst the darkness of the world. It is said that the darkness was so thick that it was palpable, meaning it could physically be felt. God had previously told the people of Israel in Exodus 3.22 that upon leaving Egypt, each woman should request from her neighbor and friend silver and gold, objects and clothing, and you shall empty Egypt of its wealth, he said. And this was made possible by the plague of darkness, which enabled the people of Israel to locate the silver and gold. Similarly, we are told to ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. And it is in the midst of the darkest period in earth's history that people's eyes are being opened, and their spiritual minds are being illuminated. And they are returning to the ancient paths and spending the silver and gold nuggets of truth which they have sought in God's word in the midst of the darkness of today. This is the time to store up the oil in your lamps 
and to seek out the treasures of truth which will illuminate your paths even in the darker days to come before we see deliverance through Messiah. The last plague was the death of the firstborn, and it came at midnight, just as the final plague in the last days will come at midnight, when the bridegroom cometh and takes the bride into the chamber to protect her during the final indignation, which is referred to as the seventh plague in Revelation. And Isaiah 26.20 refers to this using the same Hebrew word bo from our parasha today. Lech ami bo va hadaracha usgor latka baadeka havo kim at rega adya avar zaam. Come, my people, bo, come into your chamber and shut the doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the wrath is past. Joel 2.16 tells us what this chamber room is. It's the very hupa chamber that the bride of Messiah will be hid in. This is the heavenly hupa that Messiah will take us to. And Joel says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom come out of his bedroom and the bride from her hupa chamber. Exciting to think about, isn't it, in the context of the marriage of the Lamb. King David in Psalms 19 even confirmed our understanding and interpretation of prophecy here. In Psalms 19, starting in verse 2, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies show his handiwork. Day to day they speak, and night to night... Even in the darkness, they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, no words where their voice goes unheard. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. This is what's happening right now as you take the Torah truths to your brothers and sisters around the world and help all of Israel awaken in fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. The dry bones are becoming flesh, and as they're returning to Torah, they're doing teshuva, and they're enabled to be a light in the dark world and in the nations in which they are living. David says, in the heavens he pitched a tent for the sun. And here's an analogy of the hupa for the Son of God. <clears throat> using this metaphor of the S-O-N, using the S-U-N, Psalms 19.6 says, it is like a bridegroom coming out of his bridal hoopah chamber. So even David uses this same beautiful imagery of the place of the bridal chamber that we will be protected from the final plague in the last days. He says it rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other end. Nothing is hidden from the sun. And then it relates the sun to the Torah as the light, saying, the Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Adonai is trustworthy, making the simple wise. The precepts of Adonai are right, giving joy to the heart. And the mitzvot of Adonai are pure, giving light to the eyes. This is what gave light to our forefathers' eyes in Egypt. The fact that they were holding on to the mitzvot of Adonai. Even in the darkness <clears throat> of their persecution, they had held on to their faith in the God of Israel. And Psalms 19 verse 10 says, The holy awe of Adonai is clean, and it will endure forever. The judgments of Adonai are true and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold. So we're using this analogy of all the gold and silver that Israel took from Egypt in the midst of the darkness, they found gold. In the midst of our darkness, we're finding golden nuggets in the Torah. Yes, David says, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned. In keeping with them, there is great reward. Thus, we are warned by knowing the Torah. And it says that it is more desirable than gold. Just like the Israelites symbolically went about in the last days of darkness collecting gold, so should we, spiritually. For it not only warns us, but it also adorns us. 
as a bride preparing for the bridegroom who comes out after the days of darkness to rescue his bride before the impending last plague called the indignation or wrath also referred to as the fall of Babylon in Revelation 16. It is only with the very last plague in Egypt that Pharaoh agrees to let the descendants of Israel go. And although with each of these last three plagues, Pharaoh was coming under the mercy of Moshe and Aharon, and they welded the hand of power of Yah until finally, with the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh lets them go on Hashem's terms. In the last plagues, there are three days of darkness, followed by the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt. This is also in a type, an anti-type of the death of Yeshua, as there was three hours of darkness preceding his death. And in Matthew 27, 45, we see a deep spiritual darkness that came upon the land, which could be felt which would have commenced on the sixth day and lasted till the ninth day. And on the tenth day, they took the lamb and began making preparations for the fourteenth day. This darkness was a major blow to the deities of Egypt as it was centered around the false power of sun worship. And it is our duty today to also help people come out of the pagan sun worship today by seeing its errors of observance on the first day of the sun in Latin, they say di solis, but this is, has gotten translated into the English on the first day of the week as Sunday instead of God's seventh day Sabbath. And we, like Moshe, are called to facilitate a return to the one true God of Israel and his Torah. This is why it's so important to reacquaint the descendants of Israel with Yah's commandments in the Torah. And it is my joy to show you in each Torah study the origin of each of these mitzvot, commandments, and where they are found in scripture. Now, in Parsha Bo, we find that chapters 12 about the Passover and chapters 13 about unleavened bread contain 20 new commandments, nine positive and 11 prohibitive. So let's read through Exodus 12 and 13 <clears throat> and expound upon some of the concepts and call out the origin of some of the 613 commandments that we follow. And some of these, of course, we would not be able to follow because we're not in Jerusalem and there is no temple today. But we have to become familiar with the Torah so that as a kingdom of priests in the Messianic age, we will be able to officiate with a knowledge of the Torah. So Exodus 12, 1 says, Now Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of Egypt, saying, and here's where we come to our first commandment in this parasha, this month will mark the beginning of months for you. <coughs> it is to be the first month of the year for you. This is an actual commandment. We are to know the beginning of the religious calendar. Thus we get the mitzvah for establishing the new religious year with the new moon of the first month of Aviv, which this year will be March 14th. And the Pesach, Passover, 14 days later, will be the evening of the 27th, which is a Saturday night full moon this year. Exodus 12.3 says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th, day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for each household. Hashim instructed them to take a lamb on the 10th day and keep it until the 14th day on which it was to be sanctified. To the Egyptians, lambs and goats were objects of worship, and to lay hands on one was regarded as sacrilege. For three days, the animals were tied, awaiting slaughter in the sight of the Egyptians, and then their blood was put on the doorpost. The astrologers also considered the zodiac sign Aries, which the world was just coming into at that point, very sacred, as it symbolized also a male lamb, which you call a ram at certain points, as one of the most favorable signs of the zodiac. 
the cycle of Aries begins on the 10th of this month, amazingly, and the height of its dominion was on the 14th, and it was then that it was slain by the Israelites. What a step of symbolism denouncing the idolatry of Egypt on the part of the Israelites in actually sacrificing their gods. In verse 21 of this chapter, it says, to slaughter the Pesach. <clears throat> and the word lamb is not in the original, but Hashem makes it clear in chapter 12, verse 11, that it is his provision for Israel's deliverance. It is... Yahavah's Passover. As Abraham said prophetically, Hashem will himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering in Genesis 22, 8, when he was going to take his only son as a type of sacrifice. It is with Yeshua that the final fulfillment of this takes place. As John proclaims, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In John 1, 29, it was Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son that laid the groundwork for what was to come. And in the Passover, Israel became Hashem's firstborn son that would be replaced by Yeshua, the substitute lamb for their spiritual deliverance. As Hashem substituted a lamb for Isaac's deliverance, so he also substituted the lamb for his firstborn son, Israel, which is beautiful to think about. In verse 4 of Exodus 12, it says, But if the household is too small for a lamb, and it goes on to say in verse 4, then he and his nearest neighbor are to take one according to the number of the people. According to each person eating, you are to make your count for the lamb. Your lamb is to be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You must watch over it until the 14th of the same month. And here we get another mitzvah commanding us. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight. So it tells us the exact specific time that this was to be slaughtered, pointing forward to the exact time that Yeshua would die. Now these commandments to take a lamb on the 10th and ritually slaughter it on the 14th at twilight, we no longer do as we were later commanded in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, in the Torah, to only do this in Jerusalem at the temple. And so even though it began in the individual homes of the people, Later commandments were given that it should only be done at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem so that people would not go astray with their different forms of idol worship that God knew they would embrace in the years to come. And so until the temple is rebuilt by Messiah, we simply observe the Pesach with the Seder, the dinner, and the telling of the story. And most Jews do not even eat lamb on Pesach, as it cannot be offered to the Lord properly in Jerusalem today. That scripture in Deuteronomy is chapter 16, verses 5 through 7, which says, Thou shalt not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, or on your property in essence, which the Lord thy God gives you, but only at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou came forth out of Egypt. Of course, the place where God chose to place his name is confirmed as Jerusalem, as it says in Second Chronicles 6, verses 5 and 6, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a temple house that my name might be there. Nor did I choose any man to be a leader over my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name should abide there forever. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And ultimately, we will see Messiah bin David rebuild the temple and re-inaugurate the temple through its dedication, which I believe 
the prophecy in Daniel pertaining to blessed is he who attains to the 1335th day alludes to the temple rebuilt. For it was at that exact time on that exact day that Solomon completed the building of the first temple. And we will see sacrifices and offerings reinstituted as the prophet Jeremiah prophesies in those days. But I point out these original commandments just to make you aware and to write Torah upon your heart so that you can observe it in the millennial kingdom in the age of Mashiach. Our Parsha goes on in verse 7 saying, They are to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the two doorposts and on the crossbeams of the house where they will eat it. They are to eat the meat that night, roasted over a fire with matzot and bitter herbs. They are to eat it. And so this is another commandment. When we're to eat it, how we're to eat it, it has to be roasted, not boiled. And what we're to eat it with. And this is why we fulfill this in our Pesach seders. And this mitzvah, we follow each year as we also teach others uh, how to tell the story of the Exodus in fulfillment of this commandment to our children. Pictures and types are the symbols of the Passover Seder. The matzah, the unleavened bread, are striped and pierced, reflecting on the stripes and wounds of Messiah ben Yosef. The matzot are unleavened, reminding us that he was unleavened without sin, without spot or blemish, just like the male lamb. The paschal lamb was kept for four days and examined to see if it was free of spot or blemish. And this reminds us of the four days that Yeshua was in Jerusalem being observed beforehand, during which he was closely examined to see if any fault could be found in him. Pilate even declared, I find no fault at all with him. And this was to fulfill prophecy in John 18, 38. The lamb's blood was also spilled, and hyssop was used to dip into the blood and mark the doorpost and the mantle of the entrances of the homes. And the word dip in Hebrew is also the word used for full immersion, like in a mikvah. The hyssop was immersed in the blood. This was so that the death angel would pass over each home. In the same way, as the token of the lamb's blood was placed upon their doors, so Yeshua's blood covering is placed over our lives and marks us against the coming judgment of the wrath that is coming upon the world. The picture God is drawing from the beginning is that when the end comes and judgment falls, those who are already judged, meaning dead in Messiah, as the mikvah baptism represents death to the self and being raised a new creature, the angel of death will pass over us. You cannot kill that which is already dead. This is why I'm always talking about killing the ego and, and living a life of selfless love. The death pictured here is the old man of sin. This is pictured by the blood on the doorpost. We are covered by his blood, an example, which represents his death to self as an example to us how to attain eternal life. This is why the Lamb of God shed his blood to show us the way. Exodus 12, 9 goes on. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but only roasted with fire, its head with its legs and its innards. So let nothing of it remain until morning. Now this is one of those prohibitive commandments. He's basically saying you shall not allow anything to remain from the time you start eating it at twilight after it's sacrificed through midnight, through the night with your family, nothing shall remain until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you are to burn with fire. Also, you are to eat it this way with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in haste. It is Adonai's Pesach. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and every firstborn will be struck down, both men and animals. And I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. 
I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When he sees the blood, speaking of the angel of death, he will pass over you. So there will be no plague among you to destroy you when the land of Egypt is struck. And so will it be in these last days that God will protect us through his blood covering in Yeshua. And the blood was a, a sign and a symbol. Most Jewish commentators agree that by putting the blood on their doorpost, they were indicating their desire to forsake Egypt and its false gods, thereby meriting life. It was a declaration that they were willing to be obedient, and because of that, God would protect them. It was also a declaration of having forsaken the gods of Egypt. It signified a commitment to a separation from all that Egypt was and stood for, and a willingness to follow the one true God of Israel. Rabbi Leibowitz says that the lamb was sacred and an object of worship to the Egyptians, and it was a sign that they had cleansed themselves of this, these false ideas, these pagan ideas, just like the people today are letting go of the false pagan ideas that have crept into the church. And the people had to demonstrate publicly their rejection of them, just like many of you are letting go of Christmas and Easter once you realize the pagan roots and origins. Therefore, to make the sacrifice of the lamb was a definite stand against the gods of Egypt, and many Egyptians made this commitment. They were actually placing their lives in danger doing this, so it required their total commitment. It was their faith in his promise that secured their redemption, and what the blood symbolized to God which then, in an act of his mercy and grace, he covered them as their protector while the angel of death passed over. In the new co covenant, we know it by the blood of the Passover lamb that Yeshua, and through Yeshua, we have life based upon our faith in him as the lamb of God. We place the blood upon our lives symbolically when we act in faith and believe in his promises and separate ourselves from the world and all the pagan forms of false worship that permeates the nations today. Based upon our confession and our obedience, he imparts life to us, as Rabbi Shaul speaks about in Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. He passes over the judgment that is our due and takes us out from underneath the dominion of the powers of this world. He passed over judgment upon them and upon us upon the basis of faith. Our obedience is a result of our faith, as James says, but does not in itself merit our salvation. The blood placed on the two doorposts and upon the lintel forms the Hebrew letter chet. This letter chet itself is used to signify life. This is the first letter of the word chai or ki or chi that in the etymology of words from Hebrew, even the Chinese say chi to this day. Therefore, by putting the blood upon the doorpost, the Israelites um, would see a picture, a symbolic picture of this chet of life under the token of the blood that is the entrance to each house is under the lifeblood of the covenant lamb through which each one has been merited life and it was not sufficient to take and sacrifice the lamb the blood as a sign of that which had to be placed out for all to see as a confession of the faith that had motivated the sacrifice of the lamb for the person concerned also not only must that confession be displayed outwardly for all to see, but the lamb had to be eaten, fully consumed. It's not enough for us to take Yeshua as the representation of our deliverance from judgment to come upon the basis of God's word. We must also apply it outwardly as a sign for all to see and as a declaration of separation from the false gods of this world with our intent to truly follow the one true God of Israel. God here was executing final judgment on the gods of Egypt by giving them over to a band of destroying angels. As David writes and clarifies in Psalms 
chapter 78, verse 49. The meaning of the word Pesach, to pass over, is explained in the next verse as to leap over the houses upon which the blood of the lamb was placed. The Septuagint translates Passover as in he will protect you if you are under the blood covering of the lamb. And I find that to be a beautiful description because it's not God who takes life. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, the Lamb of God. Now, there's an interesting statement that God makes in Isaiah 45, verses 6 and 7, in regards to angels of death, evil, darkness. Since he is the creator and all things come from him, he ultimately takes responsibility as all things coming from him. And he says, I am yod heh vav -Heh, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, yod heh vav -Heh, do all these things. But we must understand this in the proper context of all things coming from the Creator, but not that any evil or darkness is a part of his character. But it comes through free will beings who choose to exhibit characteristics in opposition to the divine selfless nature and choose to act as agents of judgment, such as Hasatan, who is called the accuser of the brethren, who often seeks to exact retribution and the death decree when we sin. Death and darkness is not actually a thing. It's just an absence of light and life. And in executing judgment, Hashem allows the powers of darkness who have a legitimate right of access due to man's sin. In the Aramaic Targum of Yochanan, it says, And the blood of the Paschal obligation, like the matter of circumcision, shall be a bale for you, to become a sign upon the houses where you dwell. And I will look upon the worth of the blood and will spare you. And the angel of death, to whom is given the power to destroy, shall have no dominion over you in the slaughter of the Mitzrayim. I'm sorry, I said Aramaic Targum of Yochanan, but it's the Targum of Jonathan that that is mentioned. The difference between the angel of death and Hashem, who is actually our protector. Exodus 12.23 says, When he sees the blood on the lintel of the two doorposts, Hashem will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses. The Israelites also were only redeemed from the curse by their faith in the promised redemption. All judgment can only operate within the limits fixed by God himself. The evil one has to have permission based upon the legal grounds that have been given to him to be able to operate in our lives. And this is why it's so important not to open up any doors through the occult or to allow any strongholds to come into your life through sin. Because only then, when we remove ourselves, as Isaiah says, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. When we sin, we are removing ourselves out from underneath the covering of protection and blessing and we put ourselves on a domain of death where the enemy has access to operate. In this judgment, there was not a house that was unaffected in Egypt. We see in Exodus 12, verse 30, that Pharaoh's servants had said to him after the plague of locusts that Egypt is utterly destroyed. But it is not until the judgment of the firstborn that Pharaoh's will is totally broken. The custom of the firstborn having the inheritance was still held in Egypt, and by this act of judgment, the future pharaoh was destroyed. The pharaoh was the embodiment of Horus on earth, ruling the kingdom, and so with this judgment of the next in line, the embodiment of the god Horus was brought to account as a deception. With each of the deities that were judged, it was the demonic powers behind them that God was addressing. 
This total destruction of Egypt's power is a picture of what he will do to the powers of darkness that rule this world in his judgment to come. All the demonic strongholds behind the system of this world's governments will be exposed and unable to withstand him, powerless against that which he will bring against it. We are living in end times, and his judgments are coming soon upon the powers of this world. And we need to be spiritually prepared for what might occur in our lifetime and have the blood of the Lamb in place over our lives for all to see. We need also to have forsaken the gods of Egypt and Babylon and have symbolically consumed the life of the Lamb of God. Not in any cannibalistic way, but symbolically digesting the meaning of his life and death as a model and example of selflessness that we must follow. And I believe this is what he meant when Yeshua said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is showing his life and death as a model and example of Yah's selfless love that we are to emulate. And we must fully digest the deeper meanings of what it means to apply it to our own lives. Thus, in Exodus 12, 14, it says, This day is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Adonai. Throughout your generations, you are to keep it as an eternal ordinance. This means it was never done away with. It's applicable today, and it will be applicable in the kingdom to come as well. For seven days, you are to eat matzah, but on the first day, you must remove hametz. This is leaven from your houses. And this is where we get another one of the positive commandments to remove the leaven from our houses each year at this time in the first month and leading up to the 14th day. For whoever eats hametz from the first day until the seventh day, that soul will be cut off from the people of Israel. That is a serious cause and effect. Verse 16 says, the first day is to be a holy assembly for you as well as the seventh day. No matter of work is to be done on those days, except what is to be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. So you are to observe the feats of Matzot. For on this very same day have I brought your ranks out from the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore you are to observe this day throughout your generations as an eternal ordinance. And now we come to another positive commandment. In verse 18, during the first month, in the evening of the 14th day of the month, you are to eat matzot. So we are commanded to eat unleavened bread from the beginning of Passover until the evening of the 21st day of the month. This is a commandment of the Lord. So here we just saw three of the nine positive commandments in this parasha. And now we get into some of the prohibitions uh, prohibitive commandments until chapter 13 when the remaining six positive mitzvah are given. In verse 19 of chapter 12 in Exodus, it says, For seven days no hamots, hametz is to be found in your houses. So this is what we would call a prohibition. Whenever it says you shall not do something, that's called a prohibition. So we are not to have any leaven in our houses for seven days. For whoever eats hametz, that soul will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an outsider or one who is born in the land, showing that the commandment applies to even Israel in the exile in the nations. Verse 20 says, you are to eat no hametz, reiterating it. So one commandment is considered not to have any in your household for seven days, that's in verse 19, and you're not to eat any for that seven days. Two separate prohibition. Now for the next 22 verses, Moshe is simply instructing the people and reiterating what God commanded earlier. So we do not derive any new commandments until verse 43, but let's read through it to see how Moshe instructs them. 
Verse 21 says, Then Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select lambs for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. You are to take a bundle of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and apply it to the crossbeam and the two doorposts with the blood from the basin. None of you may go out the door of his house until morning. Adonai will pass through and allow the firstborn of the Egyptians to be struck down. But when the angel of death sees the blood on the crossbeam and the two doorposts, he will pass over that door. And God will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you down. Also, you are to observe this event as an eternal ordinance for you and your children. So here are the third time that we're told it's an eternal ordinance. So no matter what pastor or priest tells you that God's law is done away with, God knows the end from the beginning. And if he was going to change his laws and his feast times, he would have not commanded us to keep it as a perpetual statue and an eternal ordinance for us and for our children. That's the whole purpose of remembering the exodus from Egypt to remind our children that God is very real and he's going to deliver us once again in the last days. And so we're supposed to tell this story to our children each year at the same time that he delivered our forefathers. He says in verse 25, when you come into the land which Adonai will give you as he has promised, you are to keep this ceremony. Now this is a glimpse into the future kingdom as well when Adonai gives us the land once again. Now when it happens that your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? You are to say, it is the sacrifice of Adonai's Passover because he passed over the houses of B'nai Israel in Egypt when the firstborn were struck down, but he spared our households. So the people bowed their heads and they worshiped. Then B'nai Israel went and did it. They did just as Aharon commanded Moses. I mean, they did just as Adonai commanded Moses and Aharon. So it came about at midnight that Adonai struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn cattle. Then Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians that were there. And there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone had not died. But he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, go out from my people, both you and B'nai Israel. Go, serve Adonai, as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone. But please bless me, too. Now the Egyptians urged the people, sending them out of their land quickly, for they thought, we will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls bound up in their clothing on their shoulders. And so the children of Israel acted according to the word of Moses. And so should we today act according to all the words of Moses, both the written Torah and the oral Torah, without which we will not know how to officiate as a kingdom of priests in the millennial temple. They asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And God gave the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians and let them have what they asked for. And so they plundered the Egyptians. On a funny note, there is a historical record of the Egyptians over a thousand years later bringing their case before Alexander the Great. We call him Alexander the Macedonian because the Greeks ruled over the Jews, and so we don't think that was so great. So we call him Alexander the Macedonian. But during his control as a world power, when Greece was controlling the world, the Egyptians came to him demanding that the spoil which the Israelites had taken from their ancestors a thousand years before be returned. And when the Egyptians were asked for proof of their claim, they amazingly used the Torah to substantiate that it had happened. The Jews who responded to the challenge answered them that the Torah said that over 600,000 Israelites had been slaves for hundreds of years and that if they paid them their wages for all that period of time, then they would return the silver and the gold that they had taken. Alexander told them to reply, and they kind of sheepishly requested time to think about this because the Jewish response was so wise. And so they requested three days. 
And when they calculated over those three days how much that would have been to pay 600,000 men their labor wage for 210 years, they quickly dropped the case and fled. (laughs) And I think that's so funny to see how even the Torah is used by the Egyptians to validate their claim that the Jewish people were enslaved there. But when it comes to repaying them, there's no way they can. But God repaid them through the silver and gold that they took. And it was said that it was a perfect amount for the time that they had spent in Israel. In Exodus 12, verse 37, it says, B'nai Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot about 600,000 men on foot, confirming that number as well as children. And that doesn't include the number with of the wives. So if you double that number, assuming that they're all married, you got 1.2 million. And if they had even two children each, you would add another 2.4 million. So you've got three and a half million people that are leaving. They had baked matzah cakes from the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. It had no hametz because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not delay. So they had not made provisions for themselves. So for seven days, they ate unleavened bread, even while fleeing. Now, this time that B'nai Yisrael lived in Egypt completed the 430-year prophecy God had given Abraham, Avinu, many years before. At the separation of the sacrifice, the Targum of Jonathan gives these details. And the days of the dwelling of the sons of Israel in Mitzrayim were 30 weeks of years. That would be 30 times 7, which is 210 years they were in Egypt. But the number of 430 years had passed away since the Lord spake to Abraham in the hour that he spake with him on the 15th of Nisan, that very day, 430 years before, when he went between the divided parts until the day that they went out from Mitzrayim. God's word is so specific, and it's amazing that to the very day it was fulfilled, 430 years later. And it was at the end of 30 years from the making of this covenant that Yitzhak was born. And thence, until they went out from Mitzrayim, from the time that Yitzhak was born, the 400-year prophecy was fulfilled. On the selfsame day, it was that all the host of the Lord went forth and made free from the land of Mitzrayim. So it happened, verse 41 tells us, at the end of 430 years to the very day that all the armies of Adonai went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching for Adonai to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This same night is a night of vigil for Adonai and for all B'nai Israel throughout all their generations. Now, the institution of the Passover instruction picks back up here, and we see another mitzvah commandment introduced in verse 43, that no foreigner may eat the Passover. Then Adonai said to Moshe and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner may eat it. So in essence, it's saying that you must be grafted into Israel and circumcised because circumcision was the only display of true conversion to the God of Israel. And so you must be grafted in and circumcised if a male is going to partake of the Passover meal. This shows you how serious it is to recognize yourself as a descendant of Israel or grafted in. Verse 44 says, but every man's servant that is bought for money after you have circumcised him, meaning he has become a proselyte, a convert, he may eat it. A visitor cannot eat it, or a hired servant eat it. And so I encourage you to even be careful in your homes as you're observing the Passover. Make this known far enough in advance that if any want to partake of the Passover, that they become grafted into Israel. And if they're not circumcised, become circumcised. And it is said that this refers to not even allowing a partial convert or a resident heathen holding on to any other God than the one true God of Israel to partake in the Passover meal. This is how serious it is. And so we derive another prohibition commandment from verse 45, that not even a visitor or hired servant or partial convert can partake of it. 
It is said, or it is to be eaten inside the house. You are not to carry the meat outside of the house, nor are you to break any of its bones. Now, this is the 13th mitzvah introduced in this parasha. And Yeshua, as the Lamb of God, also fulfilled this in that no bones were broken. His sacrifice. Verse 47 says, all the congregation of Israel must keep it. So if you want to be recognized as a part of the assembly of the whole house of Israel, you will be in covenant with Yah, and you will keep the Passover in accordance with his word. But if an outsider dwells with you, 48 says, who would, keep the, who would desire to keep the Passover for Adonai, all his males must be circumcised. This is the sign of true covenant conversion to Judaism, to the one true God of Israel. Then let him draw near and keep it. He will be like one who is native to the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat from it. This, thus we drive the 14th mitzvah that no uncircumcised person can partake of it in accordance with God's word. Verse 49 says, the same Torah applies to the native as well as to the outsider who dwells among you. Now, this is another beautiful law from God that we should all follow the same Torah instruction carried down by our Jewish people and not be so fragmented in our differing beliefs and past rebellion to the Torah as people have rebelled from the teachings of the rabbis for years. For God gave Moshe oral and written instruction that the people need to return to today to be able to live in the land once again. And so verse 50 says, So all B'nai Israel, all the children of Israel, did so. They did just as God commanded Moshe and Aharon. It was on that very day that Adonai brought B'nai Israel out of the land of Egypt as a huge host. Now in chapter 13, we read about the consecration of the firstborn and the feast of the unleavened bread in our last 16 verses of the parasha. And it says, Adonai spoke to Moshe saying, consecrate to me all the firstborn. So this is a positive commandment. Every firstborn that comes from the womb of the children of Israel, both men and animals, this is mine. So here we get the command to set apart our firstborn as holy for the Lord. This covenant that God made with the firstborn of the children of Israel in our deliverance from Egypt and at Sinai, even though they broke it and they weren't able to officiate as a kingdom of priests, Yeshua renewed it. And in the kingdom, he promises that the firstborn will once again be a kingdom of priests in his temple. Exodus 13, 3 says, Moses said to the people, and here's another positive mitzvah, remember this day on which you came from Egypt. So just like we're to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, we're to remember this day in which God delivered our people out of the house of bondage. For by a strong hand, Adonai brought you out from this place. No hamats may be eaten. And we're to tell the story to our children as if we went through that Exodus experience, as if we saw God's deliverance firsthand. This is how we tell the story in the Haggidah on Pesach. This day, verse 4 says, in the month of Aviv, you are going out. When Adonai brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this service during this month at this exact time of year. For seven days, you are to eat unleavened bread. And the seventh day is to be a feast to Adonai. So the first day, uh, pass, uh, right after Passover, the 15th, and the seventh day of Passover, both are considered holy days. And we do no work in them, but we are to feast. Matzot, unleavened bread, is to be eaten throughout the seven days, and no hametz is to be seen among you. Hametz symbolizes pride and ego. It symbolizes consciousness that is expanding 
And there's two types of leaven. God wants us to have his type of leaven that expands our consciousness in purity and in selflessness. But we are to get rid of all the leaven of the earth, which puffs up and makes us proud, makes us rebellious, makes us think we know better than keeping God's laws. And so this is a symbol of letting go of all past paradigms and religious affiliations and returning to the one true God of Israel and his Torah. And this is why time and time again, he tells us that no chametz unleavened uh, or no chametz leavening is to be seen among you, nor within any of your homes. This is a symbol of within our being for our bodies are the home of God's spirit. You are to tell your sons on that day, saying, it is because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. So this year, I encourage you to speak in the first person. It's because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. We've all had our Egypt experiences. We've all been slaves to sin in different ways. And so we derive the mitzvah to tell the story on Passover in the first person, recounting the exodus from Egypt. Egypt from the world through our sanctifying process of how God has helped us have deliverance over sin and be an overcomers. Verse 9 says, so it will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder between your eyes so that the Torah of Adonai may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, Adonai has brought you out of Egypt. This is the same thing we say in the Shema, that his Torah might be like a sign on our hand and a reminder between our eyes. He says, you are to keep this ordinance as a moed. This is an appointed, a holy appointed time from year to year. Now, when Adonai brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, you are to set apart to Adonai every firstborn male from the womb and every firstborn male animal you have will be Adonai's. Every firstborn donkey you are to redeem with a lamb. See, a donkey represents stubbornness. And if you do not redeem it, then you are to break its neck. But you are to redeem every firstborn male among your sons. So here we get the mitzvah principle that the firstborn of the stubborn can even be redeemed by a lamb. Beautiful. But if it will not allow itself to be redeemed and dedicated to God, it's as good as dead. This is the symbolism God was showing through the donkey that would not be redeemed by a lamb. If we don't allow ourselves to be redeemed by the lamb, if we hold on to our stubbornness, we're as good as dead. This is pointing to the lamb of God who, if one will stubbornly choose not to be redeemed by, it's as if they have chosen death over life. Verse 14 says, So when your son asks you in times to come, what is this? Say to him, by a strong hand, Adonai brought us out from Egypt, the house of bondage. And when Pharaoh refused to let us go, Adonai slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals. Should actually say the angel of death there to clarify to our children. So I sacrificed to Adonai all the firstborn males, but I redeem the firstborn of my sons. So it will be like a sign on your hand and like frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, Adonai brought us out of Egypt. And so our Parsha Bo concludes. But it is interesting to note that most of the additional laws of Pesach were only applicable to future generations. As he's commanding us to tell this story to our children in future generations and to do certain things once we enter into the land. And yet, these laws were given before the exodus from Egypt. This is parallel to the teachings of Pani Mius HaTorah, meaning the inner mystical parts of the Torah, which will be the primary focus of Torah teaching after the final redemption in the age of Mashiach. Even though these laws were given from ages past, Messiah is going to expound upon them in such a beautiful way in the future and we'll be able to fulfill them and live them out like never before it's amazing to think about how these laws were given beforehand even while our people were still in exile symbolizing slavery to sin the descendants of israel scattered around the world have been 
in exile for the last 2,700 plus years since Assyria took them captive in 722 BC. And they, our forefathers have also been slaves in the kingdom of darkness and need deliverance by the blood of the Lamb. We also must apply the blood covering symbolically and come out of the world system today and be separated to Yahavah, not looking back, lusting after the things of this world, but preparing for the Alom Haba world to come. So now I open it up for you, for your questions and comments, and to Midrash about this Parsha Bo and its prophetic parallels for us today.